thank you very much for the introduction. You basically gave my talk. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. Special big thanks to James, because I organized the twin conference like two weeks ago, and I know what it is. I know about the mental load to try to federate a new community. It's super exciting, and at the same time, you cannot enjoy because you are overwhelmed by the discussions and stuff. So I would like thank you big times for James. <laughs> Okay, now I have to make this work and yeah. So uh, my talk is very simple. There will be like a, a meta talk to paraphrase Florian uh, uh, talk of, of yesterday, a meta talk about uh, what is the quantum en en energy initiative and how we are trying to organize ourselves. Uh, and then I will have a more technical talk about uh, an example of what can be done uh, within this QEI uh, that uh, we developed uh, within my research team before coming to the conclusions and, and outlooks. So um, as a warm up, it's always good to state the obvious, um, uh, it's about quantum technologies. Quantum energy initiative is all about quantum technologies. Quantum technologies, I like to think that they have started by metaphysical debates between Einstein and Bohr about the nature of physical reality and uh, this uh, metaphysical debate ended up in these quantum information technologies that we are currently playing with and trying to set up, which are about exploiting the most counterintuitive aspects of quantum nature to communicate more safely, to compute faster, and to measure with more precision. So um, actually, since a few years, there are massive investments in these quantum technologies we just heard about, <laughs> like, and we hear about this uh, in this conference. These massive investments, they are driven by economy. They are driven by concerns about sovereignty of our countries. And as a fundamental researchers, uh, we experience since like 10, 15 years, a massive paradigm shift in the way we do research. Uh, basic reason being that we are turning ourselves from quantum scientists to quantum engineers. And the, the challenge in there is to build a, a, a deep tech, so this compound of fundamental research and, and technology with very different logics, very different timescales, and the idea is to make all this work together. Okay, so that is, um, oh, all along my talk, I will focus on quantum computing, but obviously what I mean uh, will be further than this, actually. I want to address, uh, ultimately, within the QEI, we want to address all quantum technologies. The promise of quantum computing is basically to increase the performance of computation, performance being defined like uh, computing power, namely the size of the problem, divided by the time of execution of uh, the, the, the computation. So with this very simple graph, you have an idea of uh, what basically the quantum computing community is running after. Uh, this is quantum computing. This is classical computing. Obviously, if we manage to build the quantum computer, we will compute faster. This allows to define the fields of quantum regimes of quantum computational supremacy and quantum computational advantage. So the difficulty being that right now we are trying to build these machines, meaning that we have to fight against noise. And if we fight against noise, we have to practice error correction, which means more physical operation, more time, and therefore, we are exploring regimes where basically we are trying to know if uh, the machines that we are building are noise resilient. And if we, want, if we are able to keep the quantum advantage and the quantum supremacy while we are um, playing with real hardware. Okay? So that's basically where the quantum computing community is right now. And so. Um, Within the quantum energy initiative, the idea that we are promoting is that uh, this second quantum revolution, it's basically not arriving in an infinite world. What we have to take into account is that uh, it's happening in a world that has constraints in terms of resources. These machines that we are building, we need energy to run them, we need material to build them, and basically what we have to practice right now is innovation under this constraint of finite resources. 
One major reason being that these days, with the classical information and uh, communication technologies, uh, we consume more and more electricity. We know that we are facing wars. And uh, the idea here within the QEI is to practice responsible quantum innovation. There are two paths for this that are complementary. First path is trying to define useful use cases to avoid the problem of the rebound effect uh, that some of you may have heard of. Second thing that the quantum energy initiative is more focused on is the, the, the idea of optimizing the resource efficiencies of the machines that we are building. And this is physics, this is science, this is technology, and that's what we're going to focus on. So, um, uh, my chairman nicely mentioned this paper, uh, this uh, perspective paper that was actually uh, published in June 2022. It went very fast because the idea is that we don't know at the present time if quantum technology will be an energy hog or will present an energy advantage. And there is no clear answer to this question, especially because quantum hype doesn't help. And within the QEI, we want to avoid green, mesh, uh, green uh, washing, right? We want to put forward on the table like clear and objective figures of merit that will allow us to measure scientifically what is the efficiency of our machines. So we need to optimize, to understand and oops, to understand and optimize the cost of full stack quantum technologies taking into account all the classical context around the machines that we are building. Again, we want to define objective figures of merit, and we want to uh, understand how we can practice innovation with finite resources. So I'm telling you a lot uh, about this idea of cross-disciplinary challenge. Why is this cross-disciplinary? Here you have uh, a scheme that represents the full stack of a quantum computation. So you imagine that you are an end user here that has a specific task. You are going to program some algorithm using a certain language. Then this algorithm will be compiled, will give rise to an architecture, a circuit that will be encoded on the quantum processor at the core of the machine. And to operate this quantum processor, what we need are device controls and more generally speaking, enabling technologies that will depend on the type of hardware you are playing with. If you are doing cold quantum computers, you will need a cryostat. If you are doing photonic quantum computing, you will need lasers and stuff. So it's basically hardware dependent, all this. So this defines like three big areas of physics. You have information science up above, that is, what is to say, hardware independent. You do have quantum physics here at the core that uh, gives the rule, the dynamics of the quantum processor. And you do have classical physics that covers all enabling technologies that we are uh, using to build the quantum computer. So now, if we want to play with resource efficiency, what we have, well, resource efficiency, the definition is very simple. Uh, it's, it's a metric of performance that is divided by the resource cost. And we want to optimize this. How do we do? What we have to realize is that in quantum computing, the performance, it depends on the control over noise at the level of the quantum processor itself. So it's, it's defined at the quantum level. But now to increase the control over noise, we need resources. And these resources, they can be algorithmic. I can increase the size of my code. They can also be classical slash macroscopic. I can increase my cryogenic power to play with lower and lower temperatures. And sometimes, most often actually, the algorithmic resources impact the classical resource. If I increase the size of my code, I increase the number of physical qubits. If I increase the number of physical qubits, I may need more cables then I bring, may bring more heat. And then I was thinking I would reduce the noise, but actually I'm increasing the noise, you see. So it's all coupled, yeah. And the classical resources can back act on the control over noise. So to optimize these efficiencies, the challenge is really to, to couple very different areas of expertise 
while the input on one area of expertise corresponds to the output of the other one. And we need to couple all this, which gives rise to new roadmaps. And this is precisely what we try to do within the QEI. So this is just an overview of the timeline to tell you that actually it's an experience, a human experience that went quite fast. The paper was published in June. In August, we uh, launched a website and we published a manifesto on the advice of uh, Tommaso Calarco, who launched the manifesto for, uh, that gave rise to the European quantum flagship. So we, we had a nice like godfather in the game. Uh, so here in red, you, you see the co-founders, uh, Olivier Ezrati, uh, Robert Whitney, and uh, Janine Spitz-Teusser. In January 2023, we created a board to manage this, which is representative of the different expertise we need and uh, representative of, well, the international nature of our initiative. So you find basically uh, different countries that are represented. In, uh, in May, uh, we have launched a working group at IEEE to develop standards uh, to uh, address energetic efficiency of quantum computing and later other quantum technologies. In July, we had a YouTube channel. In October, we have uh, answered a cost network application. And in November, uh, well, that's the figures that my chairman reminded. Uh, thank you for that, for having done the research this morning. And we had our first workshop in Singapore. So the goals and the missions of, of of this initiative are like ambition, ambitious and simple at the, the same time. We want to create this worldwide community that would work on the resource cost of quantum technologies, which means creating a new transversal line of research that connects enabling technologies, hardware, and software. And we want to propose optimization methodologies, framework, and benchmarks. So benchmarks, like it bounces back on what I just told you about this IEEE working group. And we want to cover basically all qubit types, programming paradigm, and ultimately all quantum technologies. So some key scientific questions that are addressed within this uh, initiative uh, are the following, and this is just a bunch of examples, but obviously then it's to the community to define its own scientific questions, and it's just a starting point. But one thing that can be very motivating is to investigate if there is some energetic quantum advantage uh, uh, between uh, versus classical computing as quantum processors scale up, and uh, which is something that has been poorly investigated so far and is not equivalent to the computational advantage that the community is currently running after. Um, Another thing is, what is the fundamental minimal energy cost of quantum computing, taking into account the classical context uh, that is needed to, to, to build the quantum processor, which is unfortunately something that is not addressed yet within the usual quantum thermodynamic community that starts from um, the Lindblad equation, so starts from a system that is already quantum, a quantum open system. But there is a lot of cost to create this quantum open system. And that's basically what is addressed within uh, this new research line. And uh, some other thing is, um, yeah, like I said, all quantum technologies should be treated in the same way. And we already have some people in the, cons in the community that uh, are interested in the energy cost of quantum uh, communication. OK, these are our first partners. Industrial community, I must say, uh, reacted much faster than the academic community. Uh, I've not really interpreted that, but the fact is that uh, companies were there uh, on day one, basically. And uh, so, um, and our last industrial partner, I'm, I'm extremely proud. Uh, this is IBM Quantum. Uh, so here you have a, a post from Jay Gambetta just after our QEI conference. So um, uh, IBM Quantum was a very generous sponsor of our conference, and we are about to, well, the press release to announce the fact that IBM Quantum is supporting the Quantum Energy Initiative is, is uh, currently in preparation. And uh, yeah, so uh, to conclude on this first part of the talk, uh, 
you are most welcome to join. This is the, this is the website. Um, the idea is really to build an open community for open science research and development. So, uh, yeah, uh, this is interesting to get the information. I insist on the fact that this is really a, a bottom-up initiative. There was uh, no government that told us uh, you should try to do this and that. So this is really, a, 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 I would say, empowerment uh, at the low level of Lambda researcher. Um, and what is very nice right now, it, we, we, we need that, well, the community is mapping and self-organizing, and it's a nice arena to exchange and share ideas. And your inputs, obviously, are most welcome. We have a very good operational team that manages uh, the newsletters, that manages uh, the uh, YouTube channel with already two seminars. Uh, if you do uh, want to advertise like uh, job announcements, etc., you just have to send them an email and, uh, and that will be published on the newsletter and on the website. And also last advertisement for this working group, we need experts uh, to join the working group to help us developing these uh, standards for uh, energy efficiency. Okay, last thing about the workshop, because I think it's nice also to give you a, 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 a retour d'experience. I don't know how to say it in English, but to tell you a little bit how this conference went on, because it's, it's a very interesting, uh, it was very interesting to see. Um, so this slide is extracted from the opening session, and basically uh, we, we presented to the participants of the conference the challenge. We have gathered five well-defined um, areas of knowledge, like fundamental quantum device, formerly named quantum thermodynamics, quantum hardware with enabling technologies, quantum algorithms and software, HPC, and hybrid computing and fundamental thermodynamics of information. And we clearly stated to the participants that they should be active all along the workshop. It's not a passive conference. We need to find ways to optimize the resource efficiency of quantum technologies. So we needed people to be open, curious, pedagogic if they were about to give a presentation. And we insisted on the fact that questions at this point, they matter much more than answers we need to define roadmaps. So that was really the, the spirit that we tried to, to impulse in this conference. And uh, to do this, we have like fuel for thought. Uh, we had excellent plenary speakers and invited talks. And uh, what is a little bit more original is that we, we try to have really productive roundtables. And for this, to have a productive final roundtable, we needed to have some people working behind the scene, organizing like the synergies, basically. And uh, young people are extremely good for that. So uh, we delegated this work of organizing the synergies to uh, an association of young researchers in Singapore, which is named Kira. Uh, or Kyra, we never knew how to pronounce them, and they organized this in a fantastic manner. Um, so this is extracted from, well, uh, the orders that they gave to the community, basically. Um, and um, so they have prepared like uh, ways to, uh, to uh, moderate roundtable. They have organized a poster session with flash talks, and uh, we have also appointed topical teams as moderators of the roundtables. And the net result was that, well, uh, there was very nice dialogue between these very different communities. Uh, we had a very good roundtable uh, where people, they really engaged in trying to exchange ideas and connect different fields of knowledge. And uh, so, I want to announce that uh, the next QEI conference will be organized in Grenoble in January 2025. And, um, and uh, probably the material that was extracted from this roundtable may give rise to another paper. We had quantum technologies need a quantum energy initiative, and maybe we would call it quantum technologies have a quantum energy initiative. So um, how much time do I have? left my chairman uh, 25 minutes still great i thought i was too 
uh, wordy. Fine. So I want to give a snapshot of some of the initiatives and events uh, worldwide about this idea of physical resource cost of, of quantum technologies. So there is an association that was uh, created in Canada before us that is named Q for Climate that wants to use uh, quantum technologies to address uh, the problem of climate change. Um, there is also, so th this is very like uh, diverse, the initiative I want to tell you about here. There is a color code, red means structure, community that is trying to, to build up and organize. So there was this cost network that we have answered to, uh, which would give us rise, uh, access to regular funds to organize conference in Europe. Um, Pascal, the, 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 quantum, the French quantum startup, has also organized a hackathon recently to address the problem of climate change. So this part of the community is about use cases. And uh, regarding resource cost of quantum technologies, well, there was the QEI conference two weeks ago. There is this conference, so uh, organized here, that I'm happy to participate to. And uh, I also want to mention, and this is also an echo to the, um, to the talk of Florian uh, yesterday, uh, who funds this kind of projects right now? Actually, you can find an archipelago of little projects that can be funded here and there, but that have a national visibility and the support of the government. I must say that France now uh, is aware and awake and funds projects within the uh, French quantum initiative about uh, this uh, uh, resource cost of quantum technologies. So we do have fundings basically through uh, a project whose name is BAC, which is about benchmarking quantum computers and the benchmarking obviously uh, has an energetic uh, component so there is a notion of energetic efficiency and the work package dedicated to this in this big project that is uh, headed by uh, Thales and we recently had also uh, the help of the French bank uh, for public investment and we are going to uh, try to understand and optimize the energetic efficiency of two types of quantum hardware, the CAT codes with uh, the, the French quantum startup Alice and Bob, and uh, the photonic uh, hardware with the French startup Candela. Uh, and the big industrial partner is uh, EDF. So again, companies are there, and that's very important. And take a message of this, I'm pretty sure there are many other initiatives uh, around the world. We need you to map, document, and connect. And at the QEI, we, we have the platform, and we are extremely happy to receive your input. So we're here. Use us. That's the message. OK, so after the meta talk, uh, I want to give you a snapshot of what can be done. Um, coming back to research, and, and uh, so that's the technical part of the, of the talk. Uh, I want to provide you an example of what could be an interdisciplinary methodology to optimize a resource cost. And uh, what I'm going to present are the results uh, that have been recently published in PRX Quantum in, in this paper. So that's, uh, that's my research team, and we have obtained these results within a very close collaboration with uh, Wee Kun Un, uh, who is a, a CQT uh, researcher in, uh, in Singapore, uh, so that I joined as well now, but we started this work while I was still in, in France. And um, so the idea is the following. I sold you the interdisciplinary methodology looking at this uh, schematic of a full stack, uh, quantum computer, and the full stack quantum computer that we have modeled and uh, understood from an energetic point of view is this one. So it's, we basically picked uh, the numbers from CKMOR. So it's a transmon superconducting quantum computer, um, very idealized because we needed it to be scalable so that we can explore its energy cost, okay? So that's, that's the menu. And what we have proposed uh, to give you a very high level of uh, the vision of the methodology we have proposed and applied, and we, we have adopted the, the NMNR methodology, like metric noise resource. 
So the first thing you have to do if you want to optimize the resource cost is to choose your metric of performance. Can be a different kind, can be a size of computation, can also be a fidelity, but you have to choose, okay? Can be either user, uh, user defined or, or defined at the quantum level, but you, you, you choose this metric of performance. And then uh, you have to work both sides or you pick some colleagues from both sides. That's the interdisciplinarity. At the macroscopic level, you list all the control parameters that you as an experimentalist or hardware fabricant uh, have at your disposal, okay? So can be temperature, can be, uh, can be compilation of your circuit, can be size of your code, can, can be type of code you are using, can be whatever, okay? Number of stages in your cryostat, but all the classical parameters you have at your disposal to act on the computation. And then from there, you are able to model the resource cost, can be your cryogenic power, or the power consumed by your laser, you see my point. Then you can go to the quantum level. At the quantum level, your job is to extract from these macroscopic control parameters and from your knowledge on the noise, you need to model the noisy quantum evolution of your processor. And this is encapsulated in this very simple Lindblad equation. Okay, which basically depends on the noise, well, captures the noise, and depends on your control parameter, which captures the fact that your environment, the environment of your processor depends on these parameters. Once you have this, you can basically relate the metric of performance of your computation, the noise, and your control parameters. So this gives rise to explicit or implicit expression metric of the control parameters. Once you're there, it's very easy because you just have to minimize the resource cost for a target performance. So all this story boils down to a optimization under, under constraint. Okay? But uh, a pretty tough one because there are input parameters from everywhere. But the difficulty is really to connect these parameters that come from everywhere. So as a warm-up, we can try to apply this MNR methodology to adjust a simple single qubit gate. And this is what we did in the paper. Uh, so what we have considered is a, is a qubit driven by a light pulse, so in a waveguide. We are in waveguide QED because we are playing with transmits. Um, we have just considered as noise the spontaneous emission of the qubit. The metric of performance that we picked is the gate fidelity, which, well, is nothing but one minus gamma tau, where tau is the duration of the gate. And the resource, uh, we picked the energy, sorry, the power that we need to realize the pipers. This is a choice. It's just to uh, get used to the methodology. Now, the control parameter, like I said, it's the gate duration. From there, if we target a certain performance, we can know what is the duration of the gate that we need to set so that we uh, realize this target performance. And with this, we can define the bare qubit efficiency, which is the metric of performance divided by the power that we need to reach this performance. And it has a very simple expression here where I just want to insist on two things. First of all, don't be surprised. This has a physical dimension. It's not a big deal. Efficiencies can have a physical dimension. It's just that we were we took bad habits with Carnot, which is a dimension. But apart from that, uh, it's it's absolutely normal. Second thing I want to say is that this efficiency here, you see that the bigger the metric of performance, the smaller the efficiency. In other words, the more I want, the more I have to pay. To gain one digit of efficiency, I need to give always more and more and more power, which is a behavior that we have recovered everywhere, even when we dress the gate, as we are going to see. So this very basic approach here, it already allows us to have a benchmarking between different qubits, which is interesting per se. 
Um, like I said, the larger the metric, the smaller the efficiency. And now the challenge is to go to the macroscopic level. So again, the idea is that this quantum open system here, which is a qubit that interacts with a resonant pulse, it actually doesn't exist per se. You need to put it, you need to isolate it from the external noise. And basically, in the case of superconducting qubits, you need to put this guy in a cold box, in other words, a fridge or a cryostat. But once you've done this, you are a little bit like a dump because you cannot control it. So you need to drill a hole in the box to control it. But if you drill a hole in the box, then you introduce noise. So that's a problem. In quantum thermodynamics, we, we would call it a non-equilibrium situation. The, you, you need to isolate, and at the same time, you need to control. So there are trade-offs in the game. So what people from superconducting circuit do, they put attenuators here on the line. And uh, to still have here the power to do a pi pulse, here they, they, they amplify the pulse that they want to send. Okay? And that way, you have a good signal to noise ratio at the level of the qubit. But then the problem of that is that inside the cryostat, at the level of the attenuator, you dissipate like hell. And this heat that gets dissipated, you need to evacuate it. And for this specific model, this is the reason why you basically have to pay a cryogenic power. So this is a special uh, dedication for those who do batteries here. We, we were discussing at the, at the break before entering here. What you see here is that the cryogenic power, it scales like the pipers, the power for the pipers, which means that with this chain here, we have the magnification factor of a fundamental cost, which means that if you use your brain to try to optimize this cost, it will impact the macroscopic cost. And this is typically the kind of connection that we are trying to do within the QEI. Uh, we can optimize at the fundamental level, and then we need to understand how it gets amplified at the macroscopic level. OK. Please let me know how much time I have. Yeah, maybe 12 minutes. 12 minutes. OK, thank you. So here, is the, here are the results once you have dressed this gate. So you can, oops, uh, yeah. Uh, wh what you can do is actually set up this 2D map uh, where you have the attenuator on the x-axis and the temperature of the qubit on the y-axis. And here you have the ISO, I, know, it, I think it's not the ISO M, uh, it's the ISO error. So you see that to get the minimal possible error, you need to spend more and more power, OK? And uh, then you can basically minimize this cost under the constraints of a given fidelity. And this, is, this gives rise to the maximal dressed efficiency here that, as you can see, decreases as a function of uh, the target uh, performance. So this is a behavior, like I said, that we can, reco we can recover uh, many times in, in, the, in the paper for different situations. OK, so that's for the single qubit gate. It gives you a first flavor of what we can do. And uh, now what we have played with is um, what happens if we want to play with a fault-tolerant uh, computation? In the case of a fault-tolerant computation, what we want to explore is the global energy cost for large-scale computation, taking into account the full stack, as we did for the, for the single qubit gate. And we want to explore the condition of an energetic advantage. And the constraint is that, well, it was a first try. So we needed to pick a code that is analytically tractable. And we took for this the concatenated STEAM code, or seven qubit code, which is awful in terms of resource consumption. You, you never find someone who wants to do a STEAM code right now. People, they would rather go to surface code or, or whatever. 
but uh, it leaves nothing under the rug. So that's why we picked this one. And we have picked the parameters of a scalable quantum computers, as I said before, which means that I told you about Sycamore. We actually didn't really model Sycamore. We picked qubits that are really futuristic. There is no uh, dephasing noise. And we have a T1 that we can increase at will such that uh, we can actually have computation that, that uh, converge. We picked excellent information processing efficiency and uh, cryogeny at the level of Carnot efficiency. And so um, our control parameters were the temperature of the qubit, the temperature of the signal generation, the level of error correction, and our resource cost was um, uh, the cryo power plus the control electronics. And what we have modeled is thermal noise. So again, no dephasing. Fault tolerant quantum processor get, gave us rise to this uh, Lindblad equation. And the metric of performance that we chose is that uh, our entire calculation should be uh, give rise to a probability of success of two thirds. So I told you everything. And now this is the typical sky map that we could obtain. So what we have modeled basically is a generic quantum memory with QL logical qubits and uh, uh, that should keep the quantum information over a depth DL. Again, probability of success, two thirds. This gives us an implicit relation between the classical control parameters, so attenuation, signal generation temperature, qubit temperature, level of concatenation. And from there, we can minimize the power as a function of these guys. Again, this is the sky map that we have. And now, uh, the idea has been to model useful algorithms with this generic circuit. So for this, we picked the case of, uh, like everyone, breaking RSAK. Uh, with increasing size of the k. And we picked for the logical qubit number and uh, depth parameters that were taken from a paper from uh, Gedney and Akera uh, published two years ago. So that's the result. So if we pick first a key uh, of size uh, 829, what we have like that for a classical com uh, supercomputer, um, the typical uh, energy that is spent is of the order of hundreds of gigajoules, while for a quantum computer, we have two orders of magnitude difference. And that's the typical like plot that we had. OK, uh, so this points towards a quantum energy advantage. We repeated the experiment for a key that is uh, in the regime of quantum supremacy. Obviously, it's impossible to compute with a classical supercomputer. We still find a finite uh, energy in the case of a quantum computer. So what is the take home message of all this? Take home message of all this is that, first of all, there is a potential for a quantum energy advantage. But obviously, this must be consolidated with more realistic qubits, with more realistic architecture, with a full stack energy cost in a coordinated way. So this is another advertisement for the QEI, because it is only within uh, initiatives like this that we can realize realistic optimizations. Oops. And um, the point that I want to insist on now to, to conclude this talk is um, most often when we would present this result, uh, especially to policymakers, uh, they would answer, isn't that enough to optimize the computational advantage? Because if I compute faster, then job done, because it will cost less energy. So first of all, this is very uh, not accurate in the sense that optimizing uh, time is not optimizing energy. These are like just two different compasses, and they give rise to very different optimizations methods. So we had this intuition. But to make this intuition concrete, we have worked a little bit more to compare the regimes where the two types of advantage can appear. So here on the right, you have the estimated computing time uh, as a function of the size of the key for different type of quantum processors here. They, they differ basically by their control electronic or by their decoherence time. And when uh, this time for the quantum computer drops below the time for the classical computer, we are in the regime of quantum computational advantage. We can compare this with the energetic efficiency. 
which is the key size, divided by the energy consumption of the computer. And this defines here the regime of, well, sorry, this defines here the regime of quantum energy advantage, where the quantum computer has a better efficiency than the classical one. If you pick up your uh, glasses, sorry, it's not very obvious here, but there are some quantum processors where clearly the energetic advantage will appear before the computational advantage, meaning that you can, in principle, build machines that will compute. Well, they will take their time, but in the end of the day, it will cost less. Okay? Not pretending it exists. It's just that we are playing with parameters, and clearly the regimes of optimization are different. And, uh, and, and, and then at some point, for those who build quantum computers, they will be able to make a choice. Should I optimize the energy efficiency? Should I optimize the computational power? Should I eat less or go faster? You will have the choice, and they will have the tools, the conceptual tools, to operate this choice. So that's what we want to provide. Um, take home messages. So this quantum energy advantage, it's potentially a huge practical interest of quantum computing. Uh, it's, it's absolutely different from the quantum computational advantage. It can be explored and optimized now. And uh, this provides an example of one possible interdisciplinary work that we've done, and that can be like uh, a starting point from many other works playing with different kinds of hardware. We have also played with a new benchmark, which is the quantum computing energy efficiency, which appears as a new objective and scientific tool for optimization that can allow to benchmark software versus hardware, fundamental versus full stack, benchmark qubits, and may at some point allow us to build a ranking between uh, supercomputers, uh, quantum computers, sorry. Um, right? Conclusion. So one point I want to make to conclude is uh, something that we also hear a lot because there can be some skepticism in the community. It's too early to optimize the cost. Uh, of a quantum computer, you should build the quantum computer that works first before optimizing its energy. So there are uh, different answers to this uh, argument. The first one is what I just said. It is different to chase a raw performance or to chase resource efficiency. It defines different kinds of optimizations. and. We want to provide the tools to make a rational choice between the two paths. First answer. Second answer, why waiting to hit energy walls before designing strategies to avoid them? Second answer. Third one is something that also is very like, right now we have people who optimize the language to encode quantum computers. We can also optimize the energies, uh, the energy efficiency, because I think we are in the same level of anticipation here. And the last answer is that, and, and that's the fundamental researcher that talks here, it comes with really fascinating and stimulating intellectual problems. And I want to conclude on that um, by the problems that are raised by what I could call fundamental quantum energetics. So fundamental quantum energetics is, uh, captures all the work that is done at the level of the quantum processor here. It is the study of entropy, energy, and information flows at the quantum level. And it covers quantum engines and batteries. It covers fundamental bounds and optimization. I would say it's a cousin of quantum thermodynamics, but you don't necessarily need the, a temperature to do this kind of research. It uh, builds on the knowledge of quantum control, quantum open system, quantum information, quantum computing. So these are, this is the nice crowd that you find here. And the idea is to play, uh, well, to work out these different topics here. And then, like I said in the talk, oh, sorry, 
uh, self-advertisement, shameless self-advertisement here for some results that have been obtained in the group that are precisely in this little core of the quantum processor. We have played with experimentalists uh, from circuit QOD and from quantum photonics to, uh, well, address the question of the energetics of quantum primitives like gates, measurement, spin photon interfaces, and uh, lately like another gate, but uh, well, or battery within quantum photonics area. So we play that game with my research team. And now I would say that what matters beyond this, like I said before, is to see what is the impact on the macroscopic world. We can try to optimize in the core, but now we will have to see uh, how do these fundamental resource cost optimization at this level, they scale up and they amplify. This is extremely important uh, to try to do that job. Second thing, which is a bit different, is the fundamental image that can be extracted from all this work is, can basically be brought back to this very basic question. What is the resource cost of controlling a Schrodinger cat state? Because a quantum computation, it's nothing but controlling a Schrodinger cat state. It's controlling large, uh, entangled states of quantum registers. And this cannot be put in a box. We need to communicate with the cat at some point. And that's a very fundamental question that, is, uh, th that we are going to explore within like well-defined use cases of quantum technologies. So to conclude, I would say that all these challenges raised by the QEI it's quantum classical boundary that gets reloaded with an energetic perspective. And I find this super, super stimulating. And I will conclude on that. Self-advertisement again, searching for postdoc. If you want to join, I pertain to a, a non-local team, uh, one node in Grenoble, uh, headed by Robert Whitney, and one node in uh, Singapore, uh, headed by myself. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, that was a great talk, Alexia, thanks. Um, this may be a, bit, a little bit um, out of left field, but as you are aware, there are many discussions in quantum foundations about the Vigna's friend argument, where you have basically a very complicated quantum measuring device inside the box, and the argument usually runs by saying, well, you can always reverse the measurement in the box. And it goes as far as saying, well, there's a quantum computer in the box, and you can always reverse it. But if the energetic costs of reversing it are so astronomical, the argument would fail. So have you ever thought about these uh, resource constraints on some questions in quantum foundations of that kind? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I, I did some quick math. A thousand gigajoule in New South Wales costs just north of forty thousand dollars. And um, if you're talking about short algorithm where you run once and you get the answer is one thing, but uh, for quantum chemistry or anything like that, you would have to run multiple instances. Is it the case then that it's just not economically viable? to spend this much power? This is way too early to answer that question. Like I said, this is a toy model. This is a proof of principle. The code that we picked is just like uh, nonsense in terms of resource consumption. So uh, our only point within this model was to uh, do calculation that involves somehow eventually enabling technologies. But I cannot comment on, 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 on figures of merit here. The only things that matter is behaviors. For instance, the interesting behavior that we saw is that uh, with the parameters that we took, we have uh, the cost that is somehow equally reparted uh, between uh, control electronics and, uh, and cryogeny. 
what we saw as well, the impact of uh, control electronics on the global efficiency. But what matters is, is behavior. It's not absolute figures. For the absolute figures, we rely on you guys. 